So moving on, I'm going to move to our, our keynote today. Um, as you can see, Darren Braben, he's uh, doing a, a great keynote. Um, he was brought to us by one of our core team members mentioning uh, this great topic he was working on for his PhD. Um, he, he's talking about you know the, the big words here, leveraging collective intelligence of online communications for public good. Basically what it is, is he's taking what many people often refer to as crowdsourcing, but actually looking at what that word really means, not just the overused, you know, buzzword that we that a lot of people throw around, and how that relates with open source and what our communities, what we're doing in our communities, and the good that actually does. He's also going to tell us a lot about some of the great things that we can do to make that make that work better for us and for others around us. Um, so I'm really interested to find that out. You know, I've been uh, president of the Provo Linux Users Group for quite a few years, and I really wish someone had brought something like this to me when I was starting that. I think we could have done even more, even more than this great conference. But I think this is a chance for all of us to see in our own lives some of what we can do. So with that, let's turn the time over to Darren. All right, well, thanks for having me. My name is Darren Brabham, and uh, I'm from the Touchy Feely College of Communication, or College of Humanities at the University of Utah. Uh, not an engineer, and so I'm glad that you are willing to have people from the outside in uh, to talk a little bit about some of the stuff you may know way more about uh, on a technical level. Uh, but for me, open source is a really, um, it's an exciting concept for the kinds of things that I study. Um, I'm optimistic for it. And what I hope to kind of convey in this uh, keynote is history's optimism for computing throughout the years. How a lot of these technologies that we take for granted, a lot of the technologies from the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and on uh, that people built on, all of that was done with a really optimistic purpose. Some of it was used for evil, but most of it was used for good. Um, and at least that's what the designers intended. Uh, after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the open source philosophy. I'm not going to belabor that too much. I hope most of you are pretty aware of that. Um, and the hacker ethic that it's, it's predicated on, uh, and moving on to collective intelligence and crowd wisdom and some of these other buzzwords that we hear a lot of uh, today. After that, I'm going to look at a little bit of models and motives from some selected cases, hopefully cases that you're less familiar with. They're not pure open source cases. In fact, many of them kind of fall into this nebulous word called crowdsourcing that I study. Um, how many of you have heard of the word crowdsourcing? How many of you hate the word crowdsourcing? I'm starting to hate it too. Because uh, people keep injecting a lot of different definitions into it. So hopefully I can clarify some of that for you tonight, or today, this morning. Um, and then look at some of, uh, some of open source and crowdsourcing projects that are going on that make an explicit attempt to improve the world uh, through nonprofit and government means. Um, and hopefully with that, there can be kind of a challenge, a gauntlet thrown down at the end for what this community of people who have tons of skill and are able to actually do these things in addition to think of the grand ideas, what they can do for Utah and the larger community. So let's get started with Vannevar Bush. Vannevar Bush, uh, director of the U.S. Office of Scientific Research and Development. In 1945, he wrote a paper called As We May Think that was published in Atlantic Monthly. This paper influenced a lot of people. Uh, you probably have heard of it. In the paper, he talks about the Mimex machine which was his uh, pie-in-the-sky idea for how we could coordinate knowledge. He started to notice that in the 40s, knowledge was starting to grow at an ever-expanding pace. It was starting to fall into disciplinary silos. And he hoped that we could build something that could tap this different information and index it and reference it in various ways that were a little more amenable to the way we think as human beings in our brains. Uh, so instead of the hierarchical categories from libraries, he was trying to get to a point where we could just kind of magically pull up what we needed um, in kind of a hypertext way. Um, so this, this newfangled contraption at the time um, involved uh, dry photography and microfilm and, and uh, screens and all sorts of things um, where hopefully you could pull up a, uh, a piece of information from the archives and it would display on your screen in front of you. Um, a cute idea, of course, um, but what he really wanted to have happen was uh, build a machine that mimicked the brain. Um, and though he was a major figure of the military-industrial complex of the 40s that would go on to do uh, some pretty evil things, like build bombs um, and nuke people, um, and he basically started the, uh, the science to warfare kind of stream that we have through DARPA and other agencies uh, down the line, 
he actually was really hopeful that we would build a world with more understanding rather than destruction. Um, and we've heard this, you know, time and again from stories about Einstein as well, right? He never, he never intended his science to be used for evil. Um, but at the core of this was an optimistic hope. Then there was Joseph Licklitter, and I'm skipping around across some of the major names. Um, J.C.R. Licklitter, uh, in 1960, wrote a paper. And in this paper, um, he talked about, and, and by the way, he was, he was much more uh, motivated by taking technology and science and using it for things other than military use. And he was, he was funneling military funding at the time to enlarge the scope of research. So he looked at, uh, even though he was funded for military purposes, tried to get research going that would benefit the world at large, uh, which is why today we still have military agencies that do research and technology that build better dams or whatever. It's not all about bombs. Um, he was trained as a social scientist and an engineer. He had a hybrid background. Um, and, and he wrote this paper that, that started to talk about a human computer symbiosis rather than mechanically extended human beings. So he started to look at technologies not just as eyeglasses that helped us read better in the basic sense of technology, nothing that just extended us, but as kind of a way that we merged with technology. Um, so a lot of the things that we attribute to cyborg philosophy or artificial intelligence uh, can be traced back to lick litter in some pretty interesting ways. Um, and one of the things he wrote about was uh, he, wanted, he wanted to build machines where you could interact with them uh, in the same way you would talk with a colleague who would supplement your own interests. So he looked at computers as buddies. Um, he wanted them to, to, to build technologies that would improve our world in a, in a co-human way, I guess you could say. Moving on, Douglas Engelbart. Uh, Doug Engelbart wrote this big paper. He realized he had a midlife crisis um, early in his life. He invented the mouse, by the way. He's kind of credited with a lot of things, helped develop hypertext. Um, and he wrote this big report when he finally realized that he hadn't really done anything with his life and had no plan to. He decided to write this paper about technology with his engineering degrees, and it was called Augmenting Human Intellect uh, in 1962. And I think it's remarkable how early this stuff is happening. A lot, of, a lot of the students I teach at the University of Utah, many of whom were born in the 90s, um, <laughs> were, uh, they, they have no idea that, that computing actually occurred prior to their existence. Um, and so talking about computing back in the, the 40s and the 50s and the 60s is kind of a groundbreaking thing. But Douglas Engelbart uh, wrote about augmenting human intellect. And he said uh, it's about increasing the capability of man to approach complex uh, problem situations. He'd probably include, include humans uh, in broader sense today with women as well. Uh, to approach a complex problem situation, to gain comprehension to suit their particular needs, and to derive solutions to problems where hunches and the human feel for a situation usefully coexist with powerful concepts, streamlined ter uh, terminology and notation, sophisticated methods, and high-powered electronic aids. It's a long-winded way of saying that he hoped for technologies that would augment our human intellect, extend our abilities. So we see this kind of optimism running, running through. Um, and and there's, there's a, there have been some scholars who have written about what this was all about in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And they basically talk about technologists and scientists of the time as having these images of potentiality, which I think is a really uplifting kind of phrase. This idea that there's an unknown, but there's a, there's a, there's a definite way to get to that unknown by, by going through a concerted methodology to solve things. Uh, but it wasn't just engineers and scientists either. It was also uh, radical leftist French um, Catholic priests that were kicked out of the church, like Ivan Illich, who talked about all sorts of things from education reform and banking and everything. Uh, but also talked about technologies. And he called uh, some of these technologies tools for conviviality. And convivial tools, joyful tools, give each person who uses them the greatest opportunity to enrich the environment with the fruits of his or her vision. These tools can be productive systems for intangible commodities, such as those which produce education, health, knowledge, or decisions. So we looked at technologies in a broader sense kind of as techniques. Anything that can be designed by humans should be done with a purpose to enrich the world around them. Then we move forward and we get some of the more angry folks. Uh, Ted Nelson, who uh, is a controversial figure, tried to launch, uh, or he did launch Xanadu, which has, was met with kind of lukewarm response. Um, Self-published a pamphlet that he also drew, it was very comic book style, called Computer Lib, Dream Machines in 1974. This was in response to the, the coming onslaught of personal computing. And he, he kind of hoped for, for when, the, the, when we got these individual computers in our homes that we'd do some good with them. And he was frustrated with companies having locked down some of this knowledge. Um, so if you read between the lines, there's a lot of the, the first kind of 
anger that's coming up about companies locking down knowledge and controlling things. Um, and particularly IBM was in his crosshairs at the time. But he wrote this, this book, uh, hand drew it. It was a Janus-like kind of two-headed thing. On one side was Computer Lib, on the other side was Dream Machines. And Computer Lib was incredibly, uh, was incredibly angry. Uh, it was definitely a critique of everything. But when you turned it over, you could start to look at machines as these dreamlike places. And a great quote from here uh, is, why does this matter? Why does knowing how to use a personal computer matter? It matters because we live in media as fish live in water. But today, at this moment, we can and must design the media, design the molecules of our new water. And I believe the details of this design matter very deeply. They'll be with us for a very long time, perhaps as long as they can be, perhaps, excuse me, perhaps as long as humanity has left, and perhaps if they're good enough, they can extend our lifetimes, improve our worlds. This is kind of another one of those moments of optimism that comes up. Flash forward even further, we start to have the, 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 the booming of the web in the 1990s um, as that was rolling out. And uh, Pierre Levy was a scholar who wrote, about, wrote this book called The Collective Intelligence. And it was translated back into English in 1997, but came out right about the time everyone was getting those AOL disks in the mail. Um, <laughs> so this is a big, big issue. But what he saw was this, uh, this idea of collective intelligence that could be enabled by the web. Uh, a form of universally distributed intelligence constantly enhanced, coordinated in real time, and resulting in the effective mobilization of skills. No one knows everything. Everyone knows a little bit of something, and all knowledge resides in humanity, in the network. And the most socially useful goal will be no doubt to supply ourselves with the instruments for sharing our mental abilities in the construction of, and I love this phrase, collective intellective imagination. Again, these kind of very optimistic, very positive, uplifting tones, uh, hopes for technology of the time. And what this was was a big shift. It wasn't so much about technology that would extend human intellect and enhance it. It was about technology that would enable humans to extend each other's intellect. It became the conduit, the media, the medium that would connect people to people to help solve problems. And this, of course, was largely enabled by the web and the flood of people that jumped on there um, after the internet. Um, and then, of course, you know, Howard Rangel, how much more optimistic can you get than that guy? Um, colorful robes and everything. Wrote about the virtual community with the whole earth, electronic link, one of the first uh, virtual communities. Um, so what all these scholars have in common, right, is this, this optimistic hope. And they wrote about technologies that we now may laugh at, right? We, mount, we look at them, they're so old and they're so dead, they may have never actually lived very well. Um, but, and certainly my students don't know about them very well. Um, but comes out of it is, this very, very, very bold sense of optimism and this understanding that we can implicate ourselves in the design of technologies. So why does this optimism matter? Why did this little jaunt through history matter? It was to remind you that technologies are designed by us, and more so by you, <laughs> frankly. Um, humans have politics, and we embed our politics in those technologies. So it's up to us to embed our hopes, our optimism, our world-improving, problem-solving types of arrangements into the technologies we build. So briefly, let me talk about the open source philosophy, and this is how an outsider understands it. Um, and so I hope this is going to be a lot of review. Uh, the gist of open source is that there's this common source code. There's this base, this commons. And any, anybody, anybody, uh, regardless of race and age and so on, if they have the technical ability, can access this code, modify it, and then they contribute it back to the commons without any sort of restrictions or with minimal restrictions in some case uh, to help improve um, the product. It's all based on the uh, hacker ethic which how many of you have read the uh, Stephen Levy book, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution, 1984? Okay, a few, a dozen. Um, he basically came out with uh, six different features of what the hacker ethic uh, was comprised of. Involving access to computers um, should be unlimited in total. So we still face this problem with issues of the digital divide. Uh, not a lot of people still worldwide, not enough, have computer access. Um, Second, though, he thought all information should be free. Don't lock it down. Because when you lock things down, you can't improve the world as freely and quickly as you once uh, had hoped you could when you started the projects. Uh, mistrust authority, which I like, uh, promote decentralization. And this decentralization is really key. Come back to it in a second. Um, and then hackers should be judged by their hacking, not bogus criteria as such as degrees and race and position and age. Um, and so this was kind of a meritocracy that he was talking about. What you do counts more than who you are, which I think was a really liberating thing, especially in light of something that, things that Ted Nelson was talking about, about IBM locking down things and giving it to a techno elite of the time. 
uh, that you can create beauty and art on a computer. Again, real optimistic, positive things. And that computers can change your life for the better. <clears throat> so let's talk about this decentralization thing, because I think this connects uh, really nicely to Pierre Levy and some of the collective intelligence people. Um, decomposing problems into smaller pieces and distributing them through technologies like the web uh, can enable solutions to come about faster because the problem is being broken down into tinier crumbs. Um, this open creative process draws upon kind of a lead user innovation concept. This idea that because you use the technologies, you know what's wrong with them way before the manufacturer does. And this has been chronicled by a number of business scholars especially, everything from uh, hang gliding industry to tennis shoes and so on. Uh, most of the extreme, extreme sports actually were, were very user driven in terms of uh, how they modified technologies to suit their needs. Um, but this kind of thing happens with software as well. Uh, you have simultaneous solving, so not only do you break the problem up, but it, gets, it can get solved at the same time by, by hundreds of people. Um, so if you break up a problem well enough, um, you can go through it quickly. Uh, and then this diversity of perspectives, which is really key to innovation we're finding out. Um, a lot of studies since about 2000 uh, have really looked at the way that the internet brings together diverse minds, people from diverse backgrounds, and I don't just mean identity politics like race and age and religion and that kind of thing, um, although that usually does affect someone's perspective. Uh, for better to have people together like that. Um, but diversity perspectives in terms of where they're from, what discipline they hail from. Um, so yes, it's valuable to have humanities, humanities people on engineering teams, I hope. Uh, I'm going on the job market soon, so we'll see how that works out. Uh, so uh, diversity of perspectives is, is, in, is indeed important. It's kind of the thinking outside the box, working with teams of people who are different, who can bring different perspectives. And there's some pretty remarkable studies about um, about companies like Innocentive, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, uh, where actually they find out that people outside of the discipline or on the edges of a discipline solve some of the toughest problems. Then there's this idea of collective intelligence or crowd wisdom, and I'm starting to inject the crowd and crowdsourcing lingo. Hopefully I can slide that in uh, without pain. Uh, this idea of collective intelligence is that you cast a wide net, you can harness the collective, intelligent, in te collective intelligence and creative talent of a bunch of web users, bring them together in a place where geographically they may not have been able to work together. Um, there are also some interesting studies that are coming out that show that crowds are wise in the aggregate, but not when they collaborate. So uh, who's read the book uh, Wisdom of Crowds by James Suryeki? He's a, a journalist who wrote this book. Uh, he, he does some, some light treatment to some case studies ranging from you know, estimating cattle weight to the shuttle Challenger disaster and so on. Um, this has kind of been supplemented by more dense works by people like Scott Page, who's a cognitive scientist, um, who looks at, at the fact that when people work together and they collaborate, sometimes that actually spells disaster because you end up with compromise. Think about Congress, right? Uh, when they have to compromise on bills, some of the genius of the original ideas gets averaged out to mediocrity. Um, and that happens in certain types of problem arrangements. Um, so the web can bring together individual ideas and aggregate them in mass without averaging them and compromising not too much communication. Um, and of course the web is this perfect technology for doing this kind of thing. We know its speed, its reach, its asynchrony, its anonymity, its interactivity, all that kind of stuff. Um, so this is kind of the ideal technology. So let me assert a definition for crowdsourcing uh, because I think this is, this is linked in nicely with open source but it's not the same thing. But I think they, they, they rest on the same kind of spirited hopes. So crowdsourcing is when a company has a problem Okay, they need solved. The company takes that problem and they broadcast it online. They open it up to an online base of users, people they don't know how many people are tackling the problem until they register and try to. Uh, this online crowd, this collective, offers solutions to what they're given. The crowd then, in some cases, vets the solutions of their peers, thereby eliminating kind of a lot of the labor and a lot of the guesswork out of finding what the best stuff is. And then the company rewards those winning solvers, usually takes their IP, their intellectual property, and then company profits. Now, for some of you, this sounds evil, right? And the first reaction I usually get is, aren't the people in the crowd being exploited? And the, the answer, short answer to that is no. Um, based on the research I've done and others have done, it's, they don't feel exploited at all, and there are a lot of reasons why people are motivated to do what they do, and Stormy Peters is going to tackle this uh, tomorrow. So here's some crowdsourcing cases. Yes, these do fall into the crowdsourcing camp. Um, if somebody tells you otherwise, I would challenge them. Um, Threadless, a t-shirt company, Threadless.com. Uh, User-generated advertising contests like the Doritos Crash the Super Bowl contest. 
Um, and there's a bunch of others like those Converse, Chevy Tahoe, I've done a number of them. Um, Innocentive, which is a scientific R&D company, research and development. iStock Photo, which is kind of an agency of uh, digital photographers, which totally upended the uh, stock photography industry when it launched. Amazon Mechanical Turk. How many of you have used Amazon Mechanical Turk for a variety of reasons? One or two? Okay. See, we're dwindling the numbers here, as I guess. Um, Amazon Mechanical Turk is this kind of um, distributed computing thing with humans. Uh, the Gold Corp Challenge. Let's go find some gold, right, in this landmine or in this uh, in this mine we just bought, and we'll reward you if you can spot where the next gold will be based on the geophysical data. Assignment Zero was a quasi-failed journalism experiment in crowdsourcing. Cambrian House. Blah, peer to patent, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and then subvert and profit. How many of you love subvert and profit? Okay, see the hands are gone now, right? Nobody loves this thing. Subvert and profit is a, is a site that, that crowdsources the gaming of social media sites to boost rankings. So let me talk briefly about some of these cases a little bit more in depth. Threadless is kind of held up as the, the pinnacle of crowdsourcing. This term crowdsourcing was invented in 2006 in a June issue of Wired Magazine by Jeff Howe, who is a writer. Uh, contributing editor there, and he wrote about Threadless as kind of the creme de la creme of what crowdsourcing really is. And in hindsight, I think we could categorize this kind of crowdsourcing as peer vetted creative production. Okay, peer vetted creative production. On the Threadless site, you have the options to, as a user, submit your own designs for t-shirts. So the challenge that's being issued is um, design us some t-shirts that will sell, some good t-shirts. Uh, so people can submit designs by downloading templates into Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop going in and using the templates they get to design these um, hipstery t-shirt designs. They can submit them back to the site and the gallery of designs from submitted users stays up for a week and other people on the site can register and vote on a one to five scale. And of course they can also check a box that said I'd buy it, which is great market research for Threadless. In the end the top rated designs are become finalists and Threadless picks the top ones that they can technically produce uh, and then they sell them back to the company or to the community that made them on the site for enormous profits, okay? So what this does is it kind of collapses the, uh, the market research process for Threadless. It also brings in more creative graphic designs for t-shirts than any number of in-house designers could probably do in the same amount of time. And they all sell out. Very rarely do they have stuff left on their, stock, on their shelves um, and they run specials occasionally to get rid of it, but it's not a lot of stock that's left over. All this has been done, by the way, without any traditional advertising or public relations. It's all been word of mouth. Um, they've never spent a dime on a billboard or a press release, uh, which I think is incredibly fascinating and a testament to the viral power of the web. And here's their scoring designs. This is kind of how the interface looks. They've redesigned it just recently to look a little different, but the same principle applies. Sorry for my use of Internet Explorer, folks. Um, <laughs> I'm limited, I'm limited. Um, <laughs> my screen capture program's at school, so let's talk to the U. Um, so at Innocentive, which is another example uh, of what crowdsourcing is in another sense, this is of the broadcast search variety. So peer creative pr uh, production and then broadcast search would be another format. And what, what Innocentive is, is it's a crowdsourced research and development for scientific companies site. Eli Lilly founded it, uh, pharmaceutical giant founded it to help them solve some of the problems they couldn't solve in-house. So if, for instance, they were having a hard time developing a better uh, patch for their arm to deliver a drug dermally through the skin, um, they worked on, uh, they, they were, it worked and worked in-house to develop this and uh, couldn't solve it, spent probably millions of dollars trying to figure it out. They gave up on the challenge. So they started this website and they offered a cash bounty. And sometimes the bounties are as low as $5,000, sometimes they're as high as fifty, dollars 100000 and there's even a $1 million prize to identify a gene marker for Lou Gehrig's disease currently on the site. What they do is they broadcast it. They say, here's what we know about the problem so far, and here's exactly what we need done to solve it. Um, they, they upload, they, they broadcast these, uh, these parameters for the problem, and people can log on as solvers for free and take a stab at solving them. And what they do is they go through and they, they find really tough problems. They're really, really tough, really long words. Uh, that have to do with engineering molecules and all sorts of things um, and, and, and bad graphics and a whole package of data. Um, but at the heart of it, a company like Eli Lilly or Boeing or um, Procter & Gamble uses Innocentive as a way to broadcast their toughest challenges to anyone and offer basically a small bounty even though it's usually in the five figures. 
Um, and what they found is that they're actually solving quite a few of these problems. About a third of the problems they put up, which remember they could not solve, are getting solved. And they're getting solved by these lone gunmen who are just out there. They don't work at Eli Lilly, clearly, or they would have solved it. These are people who do whatever for a living. Most of them are trained scientists. Most of them have PhDs, or at least advanced master's degrees in science. Um, but what's come out is, is some studies have shown that a lot of the people who are solving these are actually on the edge of their discipline. So a materials scientist would be really ideal, a materials engineer would be really ideal to solve this dermal patch drug delivery device, but they find out that people outside of it are, are solving these things. And wildlife biologists, chemists of various shades, physicists. And so they're finding that the scientific training does matter, but the disciplinary isolation that's been happening has, is what's causing all of this dead ending to begin with. And so opening it up taps a larger net uh, to bring in innovative ideas. Then there's Mechanical Turk, Amazon Mechanical Turk. This is the last example I'll talk about uh, in the crowdsourcing kind of genre. This would be kind of a distributed human intelligence tasking type of category. They actually call what they do human intelligence tasks, hits. Uh, and what you can do is log on as just an everyday user, and you can get paid a penny, a dime, to do very uh, mundane type of things. So for instance, we don't really have ideal software yet to identify, you know, is that driver in the picture carrying a, a medium pizza? Is it pepperoni? Is it mushroom? Whatever. We don't have computing technology that's really very efficient at that yet uh, to identify pictures and tag them, for instance. So what Amazon Mechanical Turk is, is it's a way for you to jump on uh, as someone who needs this stuff tagged or needs some sort of task that is, is menial, but a computer can't really do it efficiently. You put up some money, you work with their API to develop these tasks, and then everyday people can log on for a penny a click and solve these things. So how many, how many mushroom pizzas are in the picture versus how many pepperoni pizzas? Oh, there's three and there's two. That's it, penny, made a penny. Um, and so likewise, they're only paying about three pennies for each of those. Uh, so this is kind of basically what SETI at home or any of the Rosetta at home, a lot of the distributed computing systems where they're breaking down problems and sending them out to spare cycles on other people's machines, they do this with human labor. And people make some money off of it. So this is slightly different. Uh, maybe, maybe largely different from open source because what's really behind this is a lot of money. And I know that there's a lot of money in open source, but there's not money at kind of the base kind of ideal level, right? People do this because they enjoy it. They like to build their portfolio for future work. Uh, they improve their skills at coding, at problem solving. They do it for fun. They do it for reputation and fame in a community. Uh, they do it for creative expression sometimes. It's particularly the case in like threads, crowds, uh, Threadless. Um, they do it for fun and pleasure and community and friendship. And conferences like this, building communities geographically as well. So there's a lot of reasons why people are motivated to do what they do in these online communities. So what I want to try to do is shift the focus. I'd like to get the talented folks in Utah and elsewhere to start using their skills with open source coding, open source production. Blend that with hopefully an ethical incentive to improve the world and try to build products that actually can help government and nonprofit, and not just chase after building better browsers that businesses have come up with. with that's, the, that's the paradigm business wants, is they want you to do a browser. They want you to do this. Break the paradigm. Go with other things. Um, so here are some examples briefly of, of some, some instances where governments are starting to use this. Um, so what I'm particularly interested in is how governments use these types of uh, strategies and these types of models. New Zealand uh, had a Police Act review, and they launched it on a wiki in 2007, which was groundbreaking for them. Um, and they actually solicited public input and got quite a bit of feedback to help shape that law before it went into effect. Another one that um, is fairly recent, it's kind of comical if you read it uh, closely, is whitehouse2.org. Uh, what this is is it's a hopeful direct democracy type of forum where people can cast individual votes for whether they think the president should pursue certain platform planks or not and what stands uh, President Obama should take on certain issues. So. Um, reverse the Bush tax cut for the wealthy, et cetera. You can log on and cast your vote. Um, so it's kind of trying to bring in some of that. Another example would be the Financial Explorer program, uh, which is an open source uh, program that takes data and, and rips it out of annual reports that are filed by public companies to the SEC and take, makes that data much more accessible and interactive. And with this interactive data then, people are empowered 
to be able to make wiser decisions as they trade. Now, whether they'll do that, I don't know. Um, but they have the ability now to look at this kind of data um, in a much easier, cleaner way, and they're piloting this program to see if, in fact, this, this language that they're using, this code, can actually pull the numbers out effectively. Because currently, we have annual reports that require geniuses to get through them and wade through and find the stats. Um, so they're starting to pilot this with Financial Explorer, and that just launched recently. I think maybe at the end of last year, but definitely uh, this year it's been, it's been going strong. So I look for that to evolve over time. Another example, uh, which ran from 2007 to 2009, it kind of ended this summer, um, but it's probably going to be picked back up again based on who Obama appointed to this, the uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, he's, much, he's a fan of this project, so they'll probably bring it back. Uh, but what this was, peer to patent, was a pilot project, which New York Law School, um, their Center for Information and Technology Policy, um, Beth Novak was a driving force in that, and she's now in the Obama administration, um, got this idea to help the failing U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, the USPTO. They're overburdened with too many applications, um, and so what happens is these, these few people are overworked, and they pass through things and rubber stamp them, and they go, well, gosh, IBM's probably legit. They have tons of patents with us. They're probably right, and they pass it through. And what happens is now we've locked down some code, or we've locked down something, um, and it turns out somebody else already had it. There was already prior art, as they call it. Um, and so because of the staff being limited, because very few of them even used the Internet to do their research, surprisingly, they were unable to find this prior art. So what the Peer to Patent Project was, was it took the USPTO's a sample of their applications for patents, and working with some corporate sponsors, um, were able to put about 10% of those applications through a whole different process where a community of volunteers could log on, check out what the application looked like, and scour the internet and other places for evidence of prior art and submit those recommendations back to the USPTO. It turns out they caught a number of things that the USPTO would have normally rubber stamped that actually there was already prior art and needed further investigation. So this kind of effort has saved a lot of inefficiencies and ineffectiveness in the uh, system with the USPTO, um, which ultimately later results in lawsuits and bogging down courts and that kind of thing. Um, so this is another example of how this is going strong. And like I said, it's probably going to come back uh, soon. Their community, by the way, is only about 250 strong. So 250 people are for free, no payment at all. Um, going through and combing through these dense application uh, patent applications and trying to find prior art on the internet um, as, as kind of a part of civic duty. Um, and also it's an interesting way to see what's coming out soon. <laughs> um, another uh, project which was launched this year, this is actually the centerpiece of, of my dissertation work, um, Next Stop Design. Uh, this is funded by the Federal Transit Administration and it was in partnership with UTA here in town, uh, Utah Transit Authority, our bus and track system. Um, and what they were interested in seeing is if we could take public participation, these traditional public participation methods, and move them online, just to try it, in a supplement kind of way, not, or a complement way, not in a replacement way. Um, so traditional public participation methods involve town hall meetings, which we know how, those effective, how effective those are, have been in the healthcare debates. Um, town hall meetings, design charrettes, those types of things, where people would get together and look at plans and decide what was going to happen to a design system in urban planning or transit planning. Um, and so what this was, was we, we started small with, with bus stop design. And we figured this was a complex enough challenge, it was juicy enough, it was colorful enough, um, but it was simple enough. And UTA bought in to uh, review the results and possibly implement the winners. And what we did was we basically modeled it entirely on Threadless. We took the uh, peer vetted creative process, uh, creative production process, and we launched this site. Uh, this site is built on open source technology and we're going to give the code back um, to the public since the public paid for it to the FTA. Um, it's built on Ruby, I believe, by Mike Davey, who's a local web designer. Um, and this site, people could log on and they could submit their ideas for bus stops. Uh, and originally these were napkin sketches that people scanned in. You know, here's what I think an ideal bus stop would be for me um, at the university business loop, which is where this site is, is proposed, um, major transfer hub. Napkin sketches started off, and then all of a sudden we started to see people went into Google SketchUp and CAD and all these other technical programs, and eventually all we ever saw were 3D mock-ups. So there's a little bit of a problem in the sense that we lost some of the amateur input we were looking for um, early on, but we did get a lot of great designs. Uh, this screenshot was taken uh, early on in the contest when there were 58 designs loaded. That was about double what we expected when we launched. 
Um, so that was early in the project. We ended up with 260 designs by the end of it, and they're all marvelous. I'd probably prefer to sit under these bus stops than the ones we have anyway. Um, and the top three winners were determined by a peer vote, just like in the threadless sense. And so what came out of it were top three winners, which, although it's a Utah problem, one person's from South Dakota, one person's from Mumbai, India, and one person's from Thessaloniki, Greece. So it was a very international crowd jumped in on this. So I guess there's another problem with these kinds of things that kinks need to be worked out. Global input solving local problems. Um, but we offered no reward. We didn't say that we're going to pay you. We can't guarantee that you're going to give the architectural services and make money on what we did. Um, all we promised, and all that UTA could promise, was if UTA decided to use some elements from the designs that won, then we would include a plaque somewhere on the bus stop that eventually gets built years down the road that says, here's what the contest was about, and here's the name of the winners. That's it. 260 designs were uploaded, and most of them were in Google SketchUp. They, were, they took a lot of time and a lot of energy to make. A lot of talent went into this. Um, and so people do these things for a variety of reasons. They do it for the fame and the reputation. We had a number of people email us who said, hey, I'm a student in an architecture class, and I could probably get some extra credit. Can you show me proof that I submitted this? Sure. Why don't you take a screen capture? Um, or they said, you know, I, I do this because um, as an architect, I'm trying to build my portfolio. Again, another thing we see with open source production and the motivations. Um, I'd like to build my portfolio and show a design that I made that was actually entered into a contest and received X number of votes. So the top three winners now are going to be taken and put into a kind of an executive report and given to UTA. And we're hopeful that UTA is going to take those designs and actually build them, actually act on what they got from the public. Um, so it was kind of a, a bus stop by the people for the people. Um, and we're launching another phase of this uh, pretty soon that's going to deal more with transit plans as opposed to bus stop shelters uh, for the 21st South and 9th East um, intersection there where there's basically four sticks in the ground for the four bus stops uh, for a major transfer hub. And we'll see what the public says about making that more clear. So that's next stop design. So in all these examples, what I tried to show is that drawing upon our, our history for optimism in building technologies, uh, we've, we've seen a bunch of different models emerge which have some similarities to open source uh, but are much different in a lot of other ways. And these models can be used to innovate, to bring in ideas, um, crowdsourcing open source, peer production, whatever you call it, commons-based peer production, as Bankler calls it. Um, what I hope we can do is take the open source philosophy that drives all this work. This idea that we can build a better world, that information should be free, not locked down, that everyone should have a say in building something. Um, invest it with some critical investments that, that want to improve the world. And start shaping technologies will actually have some real benefit. Um, so my final kind of hope and challenge for you in this conference, um, and then afterwards when you tinker with whatever projects you work on or if you work on open source solutions within your company, to start thinking of ways that you can take your talent or how you can harness the talent of others on the web and leverage them and move them down a path to actually solving some of our world's most pressing problems, like global warming, right? Like the financial crisis, those types of things. I don't think those are too big to think, think of, right? Making data more accessible and visual is one way. Letting people have a say in a public participation program, like building a bus stop, is one way. So anything we can do to kind of push democracy forward, anything we can do to build better systems, better technologies that improve the world, I'm all for it, and I hope you are too. Thank you very much. So we have a few minutes for uh, question and answers. We have a volunteer here with a microphone. If you have a question, raise your hand. He'll run up to you and give you a chance to ask and answer, OK? interesting to me that the, use, the word cooperation is often used in con conjunction with open source. And when we speak of the word cooperation so often, it is, there's a political agenda that uh, is by implication associated with that word that implies socialism where the needs of the state are superior. And yet the open source movement depends on the action of individual minds who are motivated by freedom, who have access. The word cooperation is the result of that process. 
Uh, this is not exactly a question, but it's an observation of something I've seen again and again in the open source movement. Yeah, no, I agree. I think there are a lot of different, um, there are a lot of different uh, political leanings, I think, of people who do open source. Um, but most of them have kind of an anarchist quality to them, right? They, 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 there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a loathing of government to some extent, right? Because it's systems in general that have kept things locked down, that have squashed innovation, that have given them inferior products and inferior systems. And so I think what I'm hopeful for, and I realize I'm pretty optimistic, maybe too optimistic, um, but things like Next Stop Design seem to work a little bit when they have some hierarchical control. If we're going to blend these types of things with government, if we're going to go beyond just convincing government to use open source code for things, and we start actually building entire systems that have an open source thrust to them, um, then I, I agree we do need to kind of embrace more of a, an anarchist quality or a socialist quality. Uh, but at the same time, I think we can do things for, for the state as well. I don't know. I may have mis I may have misconstrued what you'd said, but right, right. Well, and so I mean, I guess. See, I'm 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 optimistic and and socialist in my leanings, right? So, so I'm I'm hopeful that the state can provide goods for people. And I know there's a lot of libertarian threads that run through um, the open source community. So I know that those things are at odds. But if there's a way to blend them, I I'm hopeful for it. Thank you. Yeah, just a, a question about your next stop um, project. How difficult was it to get UTA to get excited about that? I mean, did, did they look at you like you were from Mars when you proposed the idea to you, or did they jump on the bandwagon pretty quickly? Uh, yes. So, um, no, actually, they were really supportive um, for, such a, for such a wild idea for them. Uh, they were actually very, they embraced it. And so what we found actually applying for funding for this with, with the Federal Transit Administration, they have a program for innovations in public participation, um, which has been going on for a couple years. And the projects that have typically won haven't been what we would probably consider all that innovative, right? The concept of we're going to have a public participation meeting, same thing as usual, it's going to be at the local courthouse, whatever, or the local town hall, come in and join in, we'll bring some coffee, and we'll talk about this plan. That's what they're doing, except the innovative part is they're going to email people ahead of time and say, please come. So in general, transit planning, the Federal Transit Administration, probably not as cutting edge as we'd like. Um, so in this case, this was probably leaps and bounds beyond what the FTA was used to. Uh, and UTA, to their credit, is very much on board with it. Um, the, you know, they, they have to be wary about saying, yes, we'll build what you, build, what you come up with. Because we had, we had bus stops that were drawn as mushrooms, right? The, the bus room station. Um, <laughs> College kids are involved too. Um, so the bus room station or, or something, um, or a TP, which has kind of horrible um, cultural connotations in some ways, um, negative, negatively in the history of Utah. So there were, there were a lot of designs like that. And I, I, would, I don't blame UTA for being hesitant about saying we will adopt it. But given the designs that they've seen and the, the wealth of participation, they're actually considering it. And, and we have a meeting actually next week with, um, with Jerry Benson at UTA and try to talk about what they're going to be willing to do. But, they seem very open to it, and I think um, once it's out of our hands, it's up to them to implement. But I think they're going to make an honest effort to try to pull in some designs. So uh, to UTA's credit, much more of an innovative transit authority than, than we usually see in other cities. And there are just a handful of cities that, that even do these kinds of things. So it was, it was hard to pitch the idea, but once they got it, they were on board. So credit to them. Yes? Uh, so by allowing the crowd to vote, so to speak, in, uh, say, government affairs, this is creating more of a true democracy. How does it, how do, uh, maybe say, our representatives feel by, you know, circumventing them and allowing more participation in more of a true democracy as opposed to this representative democracy that we have now? Um, so this gets back to almost the same comment about UTA. Uh, this is a big threat to people, right? If um, when iStock Photo launched, for instance, this is this big stock photography agency where anyone could log on with their own digital camera and upload their own stock imagery, you know, stock imagery, generic people in suits at a meeting table that people use for brochures and websites, that kind of thing. Um, that was a whole industry where people were going out with equipment and, and doing these really nice photos of generic things and selling them to marketing uh, for marketing purposes for hundreds and thousands of dollars. Um, but what iStock Photo did was build a royalty-free agency where anyone could do it and they were selling things for like a dollar. Um, and people were making 40 cents off their efforts. And 60 cents was going to iStock Photo. So a business scheme, no doubt. Um, but what it did was it, it totally upended the stock photography market. Getty Images was so threatened by it that they bought out iStock Photo. because They were losing tons of money. 
stock photographers who have done this for an, uh, a living were losing their jobs, were not getting work, and all their equipment and studios were going to waste. So it's a big threat, and I think one of the biggest threats to, to doing anything like this is that it displaces people who make careers out of this stuff. <laughs> so a career politician, which all of our Congress uh, people are, I would say would probably be pretty threatened by this um, if it didn't kind of feed into their own agenda for re-election. And that's my skeptical uh, view. So as much as I support the state, I'm skeptical about where it is right now. Um, so convincing Congress to embrace these types of things uh, may take someone with a lot of power and a lot of vision. Um, President Obama, for instance, has been a big proponent of these types of things. Um, put Beth Novak, who launched the Peer to Patent Project, put her in an advisory position in his, um, in his government. So he's definitely embracing it. But I would wonder, you know, um, our, our prior president didn't, wasn't a big Googler, right? Um, so it depends on kind of the technology of the leaders and what they're willing to embrace. So hopefully we get progress more progressive in terms of technology, presidents and congressmen from here on. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's definitely threatening. So you mentioned losing the uh, amateur portion of the crowd. Mm -hmm. um, how important do you suppose that part of the crowd is? And if they're very important, how can you keep them? Um, good question. So this is something we'd have to work out for future, um, future iterations. So the, the, the value of an amateur goes along with the value of having someone who's not in the same discipline or someone who is not an expert. So the problem with, for instance, professional architects, and I got, we got some really snotty emails from people who were professional architects that really hated our idea for contest. They said it's ridiculous. Architecture is an art. It's in the eye of the beholder of the architect. How dare you do this? This is so populist and terrible. Um, and we got these nasty emails. But the whole gist of it is a lot of architects don't ride the bus. And so what we wanted to find out, <laughs> a lot of architects don't ride the bus. Um, so what we found out was, um, what we wanted to find out was with people who rode the bus, what their experience was like. Right? Did they sit in the rain and they wanted better shelter? Was it too hot and steamy in the summer and so they had to stand outside where there wasn't a seat? What did they want? Did they want a screen that tells them that the bus is approaching so they know whether to run or not to the bus stop? That kind of thing. So that was the input we looked for. And we got some of that in terms of written input on another section of the site. And we, in some of our earliest napkin sketches started to talk about amenities. A lot of people wanted uh, bus stops to be green and self-sustaining. Um, so these were all the, the big things that we got, the themes. Um, but Ultimately, architects, you know, wanted, wanted something that looked prettier as opposed to more functional. And that's not the case entirely for all architects. But there's definitely a divide between the expert and the amateur. And we saw that pretty clearly with our qualitative input. Um, so when you lose amateurs in the system because things start looking too polished, all of a sudden you lose the value of why you have collective intelligence and crowd wisdom and diversity. Um, so that we got as good a quality stuff as we did that addresses what seems to be a lot of needs of people is remarkable. But any other system, it's like a delicate balance. So any launch of this, again, would have to be very careful to allow some, some equally weighted outlets for people who can't use Google SketchUp or who don't have access to it um, to make 3D renderings. So it's pretty valuable, I think, on the conceptual level, but it's also something that's still being tested. So there are no real amateurs at InnoCentive that solve these problems. There's no, there's no bachelors of, of art that, that paints for a living that solves these tough science problems. They're all scientists, um, but they're outside the discipline. So, so qualifying what amateur means might have more to do with their disciplinary perspective or their proximity to the problem as users. So that's something we're still trying to teach out in research. Good question. As these projects become uh, more popular, are there resources that try to detect and filter out the inevitable hiring of digital lobbyists or ballot stuffing or those kinds of issues? Uh, another issue we found with Next Stop Design, uh, gaming on the site. 26% of all the votes cast, um, tens of thousands of votes cast, 26% were false. We're, we're made up by fake users. Um, and, and for a variety of reasons, because we're using Institutional Review Board for human research ethics, and all that, we couldn't put too many stops in play to let people access the site. Um, so we had a lot of that problem. We were constantly on top of it. Um, and then at the very end, we did a big audit, very in-depth, to find out who the real winners were. And things moved around a bit. There were definitely people who had gamed the system by, by registering several emails and going in and voting all five stars for the ones they liked and ones for all the ones ahead of them in the rankings. Um, so there needs to be better stops for it. There needs to be better, better ways to track it. But if you had, for instance, a local problem, 
<laughs> maybe you could require, maybe you send something out as a postcard, right? Uh, and say, here's your unique code. Enter your, your zip code and your address and this unique code and you can access the site. Or you can wait those responses at the end after you've gotten all the input and maybe give more value to the local input. So there's a lot of ways to kind of screen it. Um, but I think with any system online, you're going to have gaming and you're going to have problems. And you're going to have lobbyists who try to say, um, like for instance, we had a group on the site that was, uh, they were traditional architecture folks. They were a group who really valued traditional looking architecture, Greek columns, that kind of thing, Caesar's Palace kind of stuff. Um, and they didn't like the, the harsh angles and the weird kind of contemporary things. So they went on as a collective and they convinced tons of their friends on this big listserv that they were on to vote for this one design and it, it stayed at the top for a long time. Um, so online is, is just as, just as uh, it can succumb to special interest groups and, and lobbying and gaming just as well as real life, right? So unfortunately, I don't think this makes that much of an improvement on what we already have in town hall meetings in terms of who yells the loudest or who can bring the most friends, or who can intimidate the other people by bringing more charts and evidence and experts. That still exists, um, and it's something we're trying to work out or, or figure out if we need to work it out, or how to give voice to special interest groups in, in appropriate ways. As it is, those special interest groups already have quite a bit of say with, with urban planning, right? I mean, if, if you're gonna affect a marsh by building a road through it, you call the Sierra, the Sierra Club first, and you bring them in early so that you don't irritate them. Um, and so, so you can kind of work some things out if you're a, a city uh, planning board. So I think it's, it's something that's been consistent online and off. Um, so the online thing hopefully just brings in a new element and complements existing traditional frameworks. I don't think it could supplement yet at all, especially since not everyone has internet access. That's definitely an undemocratic problem.